Another thing about Christmas is we sing songs every year. I don't know about you, it's, it's December, you know, it's okay. But September, when you go into the Walmart or Costco or Sam's and you see them all the Christmas things out already, it kind of bothers me a little bit. I don't know about you, but, but now it's December, it's okay. I want to give you a message from uh, Luke chapter 2, where in verse 11 there it said, Unto you is born this day. This day Christ was born. Now, we don't know if Christ was born December 25th. No one really knows the exact date. I've heard arguments for that. I've heard arguments about Jesus being uh, crucified on Friday and raising three days later. People say Friday, Saturday, Sunday. But some people say, well, Friday night afternoon he died. So to Saturday afternoon, it's one day. To Sunday, uh, Monday would be three full days. But there's a, there's a whole thing about that. What I'm trying to say is we celebrate Christmas, December 25th. All right, it's a day. Uh, it doesn't matter if that was the exact day. It just is the day that we have been, and not me, but uh, all the world, I believe, knows that December 25th is that day. I want you to turn, though, in John chapter 15. My message is going to come out of there. I wanted to read a little bit about born this day. There was a day. Jesus was born. Again, I'm, we're not sure if it was December 25th. doesn't matter. He came. It was historically. Everyone knows he was crucified. It's a historical fact. But in John, there's a phrase in verse 22. But look at John 15, 18. John chapter 15, verse 18. Jesus is talking to his disciples uh, about the world not liking Christianity and not, not loving him and his disciples. And the same thing is true today. But look what it says, verse 18. 18, John 15, 18. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me, he said, before it hated you. If you were of the world. See, when you're a Christian, you're out of this world. Amen? <laughs> Sometimes you feel that way, right? Well, you, you have another home. This, this, this earth is not my home, we sing. We're just here temporarily. Don't, somebody said, don't put your tent spikes too deep here because our home is in heaven. Jesus said, if you're of the world, then the world would love you. He said, the world loves his own. Because you're not of the world, he says, I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said unto you, he said, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. If they have kept my sayings, they'll keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake. You could say anything you want to people. Once you say you're a Christian and you trusted Christ, when you mention the name of Jesus, things change, right? He says, because of my name's sake. Because they know not him that sent me. Then he says these five words in verse 22 there. If I had not come, he said, if I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not sinned. But now they have no covering, no cloak for the sin. Because I have come. I came to forgive sin and die for the penalty. But I want you to see that five-word phrase in verse 22 after it says, they had not known him that sent me. If I had not come, that's the title of my message today, if Christ had not been born, if Christ had not been born. Luke 2, we read before, verse 11, unto you is born this day. John 15, 22, Jesus said, if I had not come. What Jesus was saying is if he had not come into the world, that the world would not have known about their sin. They have no covering now. Why? Because he did come. And he came to pay for the sins. I know Christmas is about the birth of Christ, the Christ child. The fact is he was not just a baby in that manger. He was the God man, the God child, you could say at that stage. He grew up. He became a man. On the age of 30, he went into his ministry. He was baptized by John the Baptist, his cousin, and began three and a half years of his human ministry to do and to point. The Bible says his face was set as a flint to go to the cross. It was all about that from that point on. Today I want to look at that statement in John 15, 22, if I had not been born, if I had not come, and put it in the form of the question, what if Christ had never been born? What would our world be like today without the influence of Christ and his people, believers, whether the Jewish, believe, the early Christians were Jewish, born again, messianic, you could say Jews that realized Jesus was the Messiah, the promised one. And so they might have called themselves Christians. They were, we call completed Jews, Jews that finally had found the Messiah. Here he was. And they were the ones that began the early New Testament church. And you remember in the book of Acts, 
Now they started to go to who? The Gentiles, the non-Jews. And the Gentiles began uh, to trust Christ. And they saw um, uh, in influences in their lives the same as the Jews now. They also had the Holy Spirit. And they also began to join with the first church there in Jerusalem. Made up of people that when Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 were saved. And so 120 disciples of Christ were pr praying because Jesus told them to wait. All right, you'll be endued with power. In Acts chapter 1, he told them, he said that you'll receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and then you shall be what? Witnesses unto me. That's the Great Commission in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. It's in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Great Commission, what? Go into all the world, preach the gospel. That's Mark 16, 15. But the thing is, Jesus gave the Great Commission. He left. He went to heaven. And the early New Testament church prayed and waited for what he promised back in the Gospel of John, chapters 14 and 16, that God himself in the form of God's Holy Spirit would come and indwell. And we say the Holy Spirit now in the New Testament is finishing what Jesus started in this New Testament dispensation of grace. To do what? To, make, to know him and to make him known. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was to make God known to a lost world. God used the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, God's using what? The church. The New Testament, body of Christ, people that have been called out of the world, that are born again, saved, blood-washed, once sinners, now forgiven sinners, Christians, whether Jew or Gentile, to form what's called the New Testament church, to go into all the world and make God known through the preaching of the gospel. But what I want to say to you, how about if Jesus didn't come? How would this world be? We think things are bad, and it is bad. And you watch the news. I don't know about you. I, I don't even know what to watch anymore. It's, it's, we talked about it at the men's breakfast yesterday. And we, when we say at the end, we get all excited and upset. But when all said and done, we said, but we know the end. We know the finished. We know the end of the book. We know what's going to happen. We're saved. We're going to heaven. The lost, they're going to be eternally separated from God. And this world finally is going to be ruled and reigned by Jesus in the millennial kingdom. It's going to be a lot different. But now <laughs> we're going to have our problems here. How, if Jesus, how spiritually and morally destitute would the world be? The world, even with God's people and churches and Christianity, especially in America, the freedoms we have, still wicked, vile, horrible. But how much worse would it be if Christ had not been born? Life without Christ, to me anyway, and I'm sure to most of you, unthinkable, right? We know when Jesus left the glory of heaven, came into the world as a babe in a manger. He brought hope and help to mankind. But again, the question what if he wasn't born? A pastor was preparing a Chris, Christmas message. He fell asleep in the study. I don't want to tell you that I do that, but I get up when Terry leaves for school. We get up quarter to five. <laughs> Still dark out. I'm like, that can't be your alarm. I think we just went to bed. No, it's the alarm. I have to get up. She takes the shower. I check my phone. Any messages? She's out. I go in. We get dressed, we have breakfast, we pray, we read a little devotion together, and, and we head out. 6.30. It's still dark sometimes, right? I come here, she goes to school, Hanalani teaches, I come here to study, nice in my office, quiet. And, you know, we had breakfast, we had a cup of coffee, so I'm wide awake now, studying, reading, you know, my mind is sharp. <laughs> then I go home, have lunch, go to Terry, we have lunch every day together at Hanalani. I say, all right, Terry, I'll see you when you get done, about 3.30. I'm going back to the church or whatever I have to do. So I come back to the church now. I just had lunch, you know. <laughs> I'm typing. Sometimes my finger gets stuck. I think there's crazy glue on my keys. And I'll, I'll, I'll be typing, and all of a sudden I look up, and there's about five pages of S's. And I, you know what happened? I, 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 I fell asleep at the computer for like a minute or so, and my finger got stuck on the thing. And I say... All right, I need a cup of coffee again. I go into the church. We have a curry, you know, the K-cups. I got the case of the uh, Costco coffee. <clears throat> put one in, put a little cream in. I think I feel like I'm awake, but I get back on that thing. <laughs> I get the afternoon blahs. Anybody ever get that? I feel like, <laughs> I feel like I'm in a coma or something. And uh, this pastor was preparing his Christmas message and fell asleep in the study. When I first read the story, I said, what a, what a bum. And then I said, wait a minute, better not say that. 
He was dreaming that he was in a world as pastor which Jesus had never come. He was dreaming about it. He walked down on the street in his dream, but there were no church steeples which pointed to heaven. He was summoned by a weeping child in his dream to visit her dying mother. But when he got to the hospital, there was no Bibles. You know, usually you go in the drawer of a hospital or a hotel, you got the Gideon Bible. No, there wasn't any. And no promises about heaven there that he could read to comfort her. He bowed his head and he wept in his dream in bitter despair, but he could offer her no hope beyond the grave. Suddenly he was awakened from his slumber by the church choir practicing in the other room a familiar Christmas carol. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. And as he was awakened by the choir singing, joy filled his soul as he realized afresh and anew the importance of Christ's coming. Could you imagine this morning, for a few minutes, we're going to talk about what would life be like if Christ had not been born? Could you imagine? I can't. Number one, if Christ had not been born, here's the facts, God would have been a liar. You say, well, God's, God's sinless. He's perfect. I know that. If Christ had not been born, though, that would make God a liar. How, why would you say that? Well, two things. First, his character would have been untruthful because in the Old Testament, here's the thing. God is love. We know that. But God is truth. Amen? Truth is one of his character traits. And Deuteronomy, the Old Testament, in chapter 32, verse 4, said this. It says, he is the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are judgment. A God of truth without iniquity. Just and right is he. He's truth. Jesus said, remember in John 14, 6, I quoted it earlier. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Psalm 117, verse 2 says this. His merciful kindness is great toward us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise ye the Lord. That's what it says in the psalmist. And that was a song that they sung over and over. The truth of the Lord. Romans, New Testament. Paul wrote this. Chapter 3, verse 4. By the way, I fixed this thing. I'm leaning on it today. I noticed I didn't fall down. I put a piece of wood in there, screws, some finished nails. Good as new. I could punch it now. Nice and strong. This side, I don't know. Romans 3, 4 says, Let God be what? True, every man a liar. (laughs) Titus chapter 1, verse 2 says, As believers, we live in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. I love that one in Titus 1 too. I was, God cannot lie, it says in his word about himself. He is truth. One thing you can count on in the crazy world we live is God's integrity. Amen? If Christ had not been born though, God would be a liar because he promised to send a redeemer to the world. When did he do that? Way back in the first book of the Bible, Genesis God's promises, number two, would have been found, not only would it be a liar, but his promise would be you could not trust it, untrustworthy. Uh, if you have your Bibles, look there real quick, Genesis 3. We say John 3.16, well, Genesis 3.15. <laughs> Genesis 3.15 says, after Adam and Eve fell because of sin, disobedience to God, they were punished. The whole human race now, because of their sin, we are sinners as well. Genesis 3.15 says, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, God said to Adam. Between thy seed and her seed, it shall bruise thy head. But, talking about the seed eventually of the woman that would come, the Messiah, you shall bruise his heel. The promise that would have never been fulfilled. In fact, all the prophecies, this is just the first one, concerning the Messiah given by God to the Old Testament prophets would have all been null and void if Jesus hadn't come. But, I always like the little three-letter word but in the Bible. But God, who is the truth, because of his sovereignty, looked down and knew no man, no human, would be able to do this and to take the place of what he was about to do. That Savior that was needed was God himself, known as Jesus of Nazareth, who was born, and the Bible says, in the fullness of time, just as the prophets declared. And so the very character of God, it depends on the promises he made. Four words you should never forget. God keeps his word. God keeps his word. Amen? They did a USA Today poll. Don't you like those polls? 
I'm glad I'm not a Pole. I'm Italian. Amen? A USA Today poll <laughs> found 56... Tom gets my jokes. He sent me a joke this week. Uh, it was the candy canes, you know? And they were all walking around like they had legs and arms, candy canes, going to the candy cane chiropractor. And they walked in like this. They came out straight like this, the candy canes. Uh, anyway, listen, this poll found... Listen to this now. This is 56%, more than half of American parents, which is good, should be better than that, but they teach honesty to their children. We always said, when I had our children, Terry and I, <laughs> Terry has her kids, I have mine, but we can't have kids now, we're too old. But <laughs> my children, when they were young, we raised them, look, you, got, you cannot lie. That was the big thing for us, big, and it should be. If they start to lie and get away with it, their whole life is gonna end up a lie, you know that? But only 56 of American parents teach honesty. It should be like 98 or 100. Then they did a Lewis Harris poll. That was USA Today. It said 65%, this other poll, of high school students said that they would cheat on an exam if it was important that they had a pass. That they would, 65% said they would cheat. I used to uh, coach. I played football in high school and college, and then I coached in Florida. I loved it. And so first thing we get out there, we're going to loosen up, we get in a circle, you know, jumping jacks, push up, sit up, and I'd be looking around, it was a circle. So if I was looking at this part of the circle, then the Christmas tree back here, I'm, I'm not looking at it, you know what I'm saying? And I'd do a quick turn, and there were kids not doing their push ups, not doing their sit ups. And I always say this, my son today, he's almost 40 years old, still remembers what I said because he was on the team. I say, if you cheat on your push ups, someday you're going to cheat on your taxes. If you lie here, you're lying to yourself. You're going to live your whole life a lie. You say, really? Probably. <laughs> this is a bad thing. If somebody's going to lie and cheat on things, they're going to live their whole life a lie. Never good. Never good to lie. Recently, a, a doctor appeared on a network talk show and said, lying, a doctor now. Lying's an important part. He was probably one to cheat on his test. <laughs> it's an important part of social life. Lying. And children who are unable to lie are children who have developmental problems. Well, I guess I'm a little retarded or something here because we were told not to lie, man. If we lied or said a bad word, my grandmother, Lupino, my mother's maiden name, I got the soap in the mouth. You ever get the soap in the mouth? I'm forever blowing bubbles, right? Well, the world's philosophy and the psychiatrists and the medical people that are saying lying is an important part of social life and it's okay to lie. I'm not going to teach my kids. Don't you teach your kids that baloney. That might be the world's philosophy, but God is truth. Amen. God is not a lie. I'm glad God didn't lie when it came to my salvation. My future and your future in eternity depends on God not lying. Amen. We said if Christ had not been born, God would have been a liar. Number two, Christ had not been born, we would have a Bible. My Bible's over there. This is a songbook. A Bible which is incomplete and inaccurate and false. It's God's Word. Look, there's many, many churches, hundreds of thousands of denominations and religions on the world, but we need somewhere you can go, a church that people are really saved because they trusted what God's Word said and know that you have God's Word in your hand and that you're preaching not man's words, but God's Word, and that it's true, and that it is accurate, and it's inerrant and infallible and eternal and preserved and inspired. All those things are true. But if Christ had not been born you wouldn't be able to trust it. Why? Number one, the Bible says about itself in Psalm 119, one of the greatest chapters in the Bible, about the Bible, Psalm 119, 89, it says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. All right, we have God's word. I know it's here on this earth, but it's as if we have his word from heaven to man, and we can trust it, and it's not a lie. Psalm 19, Psalm 19, verse 7 to 11. This is a song that we sing. I won't sing it for you today. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And based on that verse, they started the way of the master that we taught here in Sunday school a couple of years ago about using God's law, which is perfect, to see souls converted. 
We use the Ten Commandments and ask people if they've ever lied. If they've, and they have to say, yes, of course, everybody's lying. Well, then you're guilty of breaking God's law and you need to be saved. But the words in Psalm 19, like the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, these are uh, synonyms for God's word. All right, you could put, I wouldn't do this, but think in your mind, he's talking about his word, the Bible. The law of the Lord, the Bible is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord, the Bible is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord, the Bible is right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord, the Bible is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord, his word, are true and righteous altogether. And it sums it up in verse 11, more to be desired. What? What's more to be desired? The law, the testimony, the statutes, the commandments, the word of God. More to be desired than gold. One of the most precious things on this earth. Got our wedding ring right here, right? Gold. When we had our wedding rings made in the mall there, the, was that Hawaiian? Uh, what was the name of the place? I forget. Terry knows the lady there. We're measuring the ring. So Terry, eight. You know the thing they put on to measure your finger? Frank Cuzo, 13 and a half. I don't know what it was. So they give us the price. Terry, I don't know, it was 700, whatever it was. A Frank, a 1500. I mean, wait, wait, wait. Her ring, my ring, why is mine twice as oh, It's twice as big. We have to use more gold in your ring. Oh, baby. Sometimes it's not good to be big, right? More to be desired, God's word, than gold. Much fine gold. Sweeter. Terry likes honey on her yogurt. We're on a diet. We get zero fat yogurt. It's like having zero fat half and half in your coffee. I mean, why would you do it? But we're trying to cut down. You have zero points of Weight Watchers with zero yogurt. It tastes like zero, but she loves it. So in the morning, we have a little egg maybe, and I get her a little Tupperware, a little yogurt, some frozen blueberries, and a little honey. Because it's terrible. It's like you ever do spackling work and sheetrock, you put the sheetrock, you take that big jug and the spackle on, that's what it tastes like. <laughs> Just think about that for a minute. You put that nice honey, local honey. They say honey is supposed to be good because the bees in this part of the world give you natural immunity. So wherever you live, you get the honey from that area. It's supposed to build natural immunity. And it's sweet. Honey is like a, a condensed... Sugar, you know, very, very sweet. People say, I can't have sugar, but I can have honey. No, if you're diabetic, you shouldn't have honey either because it's, it's concentrated sugar, but it's, it's natural. Yeah, I know it's natural. More, what's more to be desired than gold? Not the songbook. God's word. <laughs> Sweeter than honey. I know we don't eat the Bible. We don't taste it. <laughs> But you know what? I bet it would taste better than yogurt if you did eat the Bible. But it's sweet. It's satisfying, that means. I, uh, I like a good piece of cake. But you ever see a cake? It looks so beautiful. You go to a wedding, they have all that. What do they call that icing now that they roll out? What? Fondant or something? It looks like a piece of uh, formica that they put on the countertop and they, made it, they heated it up so it mold around the cake. I know it looks beautiful when you go to slice into it. It's very thick. I don't like it. It's too sweet. You know what I like, though? Good cake that's moist. When you go to a wedding, you see this big, beautiful cake, and they go, the bride feeds the groom, and everybody gets a piece, and you take a bite, and you're like, <clears throat> it's dry. It's terrible. I don't like it. It looks great. It looks great. How much you pay for that? $2,000. And I'm thinking, you, know, you got taken. But I like good. You know, we watch this English baking show on TV. You ever see the British baking show? They don't call it cake. What do they call it? Sponge. I can't even pronounce it like they do. Sponge. We have the sponge here with our tea. It's tea time. But they'll say on the show, oh, that's dry. Or you didn't do this. Or you put too many eggs or not enough milk or you, whatever. That's what happens when you eat a nice piece of cake. What does it do? It's ah, oh, it satisfies. I, 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 my mother's recipe, if you were here a couple of Wednesdays ago, I had pumpkin pie for Thanksgiving. Half cheesecake. <laughs> Who doesn't like cheesecake? Philadelphia, cream cheese with half pumpkin, half cheese. Good, right? If you had it. And it wasn't her recipe. I think she got it off the Philadelphia box. But we say it's my mother's recipe. It's really Philadelphia cream cheese recipe. But it's good. And what does it do? When me and Terry had a little piece left, we took it home. 
and we're on the diet now, but Thanksgiving we cheated. I said, Terry, there's two pieces of that pumpkin pie. You feel like I have? sometimes we have popcorn, you know, watching TV. No, I don't forget about the popcorn. I <laughs> want the pie. <laughs> and we eat it, and it's just like sweet. This is how God's work. Can you imagine the Bible supposed to satisfy the deep needs? We're studying uh, Ecclesiastes Wednesday. Solomon, he tried everything in life. He's the king, richest man in the world. All the stuff that people would come from all over the world to see what Solomon did and its beauty there and the temple and everything. But everything he said is vanity. <laughs> so uh, we would say, boy, I wish I had half of what Solomon had. One percent of what Solomon had. But you know what? He had it. And he still found emptiness, bitterness. This is what the Bible is supposed to do. It's sweet. If Christ had not been born, it'd be very bitter <laughs> because we wouldn't have one. And what we had in the Bible would have been a lie, just like God would have been a liar if Christ hadn't been born because of all the promises he made to send the Messiah. The Bible would have been inaccurate and incomplete. We have a perfect Bible and we have a perfect message that we're not to keep, we're to give out. Amen? Jesus paid for the penalty of our sins when he died on the cross. Amen? First, uh, 2 Corinthians, I'm sorry. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, He, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? Jesus was sinless perfect. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Because of what he did on the cross. He who was rich became poor for our sakes. That we who are poor may be made rich. Say it another way. John chapter 1 verse 17 says, The law was given by Moses, right? The Ten Commandments and others. But grace and truth came by who? Jesus Christ. So Jesus, through his birth, brought us the fulfillment of God's plan for the ages and for man. What if Christ had not been born? Can you imagine? God would have had to be found a liar. Christ had not been born. The Bible would have been inaccurate and incomplete. And number three, if Christ had not been born, the world would have never seen its only perfect man. You say, Jesus was the God. I know he was, but he was still a man. He was the perfect, sinless man spotless lamb. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, without controversy, great is this mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. How? Christ. Justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Two things there about 1 Timothy 3.16. He is the sum of of divine perfection, Jesus, the sum of all human virtues, the flower, you could say, of humanity. Colossians 2.9 says, For in him, Jesus, dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily, incarnate. In Christ, God revealed himself to man as a human, in human flesh. John 1.14 says, The word was made flesh, dwelt among us. We beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He was perfect man and perfect God. He lived 33 and a half years in this world, but you know what? Never sinned. <laughs> he was tempted in all points like as we are. Oh, yes, he was, but yet without sin. He was the divine pattern. He left us an example of love, holiness, forgiveness, forbearance. The best man in our world today is still a sinner, but Christ knew no sin. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 starts out like this. For even hereunto were ye called, us as believers, we were called what? Because Christ suffered, leaving us an example. We should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. It was in God's hands. Jesus was not murdered. He went to the cross willingly for our sins. When he came to this world, he found it a dark barren place and he left the light of his love in it so men can walk in the light jesus said in john 8 12 i am the light of the world he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light of life and he's not talking about human life there he's talking about spiritual life eternal life the world ruined by the fall would still abide in darkness if jesus hadn't come if Christ had not been born, God would have been a liar. His word would have been incomplete. The world would have never seen his own, its only perfect man. And fourth and last, 
Christ had not been born, we would have to face an eternity without hope. Without hope. Christ was born to give us hope beyond the grave. I know we, we talk about the, the death of family, friends, loved ones. We, we miss them. It's a sad thing. It's sad. It's tragic. It's, I don't think you ever get over the death of a loved one. The first time someone in my family that was very close to me died, it was my grandfather, Cuzo, Frank Cuzo. I was named after him. And I was in high school. You know what? The day that he died, the day after I went to school, I wore sunglasses to school, inside the school. People looking at me, why do you have sunglasses on? I, I was tearful. You know, I was thinking about my grandfather, the good times we had, and would, would you know, shed a little tear. I don't want anybody to say, I'm a, I'm a football player, we don't cry. You know, so I had to hide it. But it affects you. Christ was born, and he, we do have hope beyond the grave. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy, that means getting something you don't deserve, he has begotten us again, born again, unto a living, lively hope. How? By the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus was the first fruits. He rose from the dead. So we too will come and be raised from the grave to an inheritance we've been raised to incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you. You go to a restaurant, you call some restaurants, you got to call and make a what? A reservation. Maybe it's a good place, a little fancy, your anniversary, whatever. We have a reserved place for us, amen? In heaven. Reserved. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. Well, if Christ hadn't come, we wouldn't have that lively hope. We have no hope. Titus chapter 3 says this in verse 5, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By what? The washing of regeneration, a new birth, the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed, God did, abundantly on us through Christ our Savior. That being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope. Hope! Not the kind of hope, I hope I'm going to heaven. No, a hope that you know you're going to heaven. By his coming, Christ brought, brought life and immortality through the gospel. He is our hope. Without him, there is no hope. Christ was born to give us that blessed hope. Without him, no hope. Secondly, he was born to give us a home in glory. Christ brought a complete revelation of the hereafter. He spoke about heaven. Of course, he spoke about hell. He spoke more about hell than heaven, but he spoke about heaven. Showing thus the importance of being prepared. John chapter 14, which we quote a lot here. John 14, 1. He said, let not your heart be troubled. His disciples, when he talked about he was going to die, go to the cross, they were troubled. Don't be troubled, he said. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there's many mansions. And if we're not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am in heaven, ye may be also. I'm glad about that fact. That we're not just trusting in a, a fairy tale, amen? A woman by the name of Sandy Willie related a Christmas story that occurred during the war, World War II. This woman, Sandy, would tell this story every year, and here was her story. She said a woman named Ann took her children to Texas to be with her parents, because her husband was stationed in Europe. They didn't want to be alone for Christmas, so they were going to Grandma's house in Texas, Anne, with her two kids. As they prepared for Christmas and got the tree up and all the gifts they bought and were enjoying the joy of Christmas, putting aside the worry of the war that the father was there while they were here celebrating Christmas. So about a week before Christmas, they got the knock on the door with a telegram greeting. The mother had to tell the children that day that daddy won't be coming home for Christmas, not now, not ever. And then Anne, the woman that Sandy's telling the story about, Anne went up to her room to weep alone. Grandma and Grandpa debated about what to do, and finally they decided, we're taking down the Christmas tree, we're going to take down all the decorations, we're going to put the gifts away. Well, when Anne came out of the room where she was crying and saw everything empty and put away, she said, Mother, what have you done? And her mother said, listen, you're so brokenhearted. Your father and I talked and decided this is no time for Christmas. 
Anne said, oh no, mother, bring the tree back. Christmas was made for times like these. Amen? That's why Christ came, to give us hope beyond the grave, to give us a home, an eternal home in heaven. The question I asked, if Christ had not been born, if that were true, we'd have no hope. But we do have hope, amen? Because in the fullness of time, Christ was born, and he did live a sinless life, and he did die, and he rose from the grave to pay, put, to defeat death, hell, and the grave, to justify us. And he lives forevermore, as he said in John chapter 14, preparing a place for us. What about you this morning? Do you believe the Christmas story? You know, when we were young, we say, Santa Claus is coming. Of course, it's a lie. And when I got married and we had our children, we said, we're not going to tell our kids there's a Santa Claus because if they see us lying about that, I know it's a little kid's thing and, oh, Pastor Cuso, you shouldn't be so serious, but I'm serious. We didn't want to lie to our kids. And our kids, of course, heard about it from relatives and come to us and say, what about Santa Claus? And here's what my wife would say. She was a school teacher. They had all the answers to teachers, you know. <laughs> he lives in the land of dreams and the land of imagination. That's what she told them. So that she didn't have to someday say, well, we lied to you all these years. Because you lie to your kids about even Santa Claus. They're going to think, what else are they lying about? Do not ever lie. Say, so, well, she made up a story. Yeah, but it wasn't the truth. And it was the land of make-believe and the world of imagination. Something like that. I don't even remember what it was because I didn't tell them that. But... Uh, they knew we wouldn't lie. Uh, are we perfect parents? No. But God's perfect. Amen. God is truth. Uh, and God, again, had a plan. The Bible says this was a plan before the foundations of the earth. This is not something God said, whoop, man sinned. Whoop, I got to have an answer. Let me see. What can I do? Oh, I know. I'll go to the earth. Call me Jesus. No, God, this was, he knew God's foreknowledge. God never had a beginning. And God knows that man would sin. And he made, he had a plan in place. Because why? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish and have everlasting life. Have you trusted in the Christ of Christmas? Jesus was born. Was it December 25th? I don't know. We'll find out when we get to heaven. It's not important. Important fact is he was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life. When he died in John, it says, he said these words, it is finished. Now, I, again, before I was saved, I used to think that meant I'm done, I'm dead, my life is I'm finished, it's over. No, it doesn't mean that because in the original language of the Bible, in the Greek, it meant it's been paid in full. That's what the words mean. It's finished, it's been paid. What was paid for? The penalty of the price of sin that would send us all to a Christless and a godless hell separated from God. The Bible calls it the second death. We all, unless the Lord comes, will go through a physical death. As painful as that sounds, we're all going to die someday of a physical cause or natural cause. But if we do die and we're saved, we do not die spiritually. We have eternal life in heaven. Somebody said if you, if you were born once, you just have a physical birthday, you'll die twice. You'll die physically and spiritually. The Bible calls going to hell second death. Read Revelation 20, 14. So if you die, if you're born once, you'll die twice. But if you've been born twice, physical and spiritual, you'll die only once. Amen. You'll have an eternal, everlasting life in heaven with God forever and ever. I, again, my mind is, is finite. I can't comprehend infinity. But I believe the Bible. Amen. I believe the Bible about the birth of Christ. I believe about his death, his resurrection, and I believe about a future home in heaven. Amen. Everything God says is true. If you're here today and you never trusted Christ, not the babe in the manger, but the eventual Savior of the world, sinless Savior, went to the cross, paid for our sins. How do you do that? I come to church. I think I'm a Christian. I used to think I was a Christian too. When somebody asked me if I died, go to heaven, I said yes. But I was ignorant to the biblical facts of the gospel. That yes, I'm a sinner. No, I don't deserve to go to heaven. I deserve to be separated from God forever in a place called hell. But you know what? Nobody in their right mind, when they understand these things, says, Yee-hoo! I'm glad I'm going, to, I'm going to go to hell forever. No. And you find out the facts, and we were led to Christ by a, a soul-winning woman, one of my patients in Florida, that led my wife and I to Christ on July 8, 1982, Thursday night, about 8.30 p.m. She showed us from the Bible what the Bible has to say, verse after verse after verse. And we came to a point 
She says, now do you understand? And I said, yes. It was like the light bulb went on. We prayed that night by faith. Like Romans chapter 10 says, we confess with our mouth. We prayed and we believed in our heart the resurrection, the gospel. We prayed the sinner's prayer. We trusted Christ. We got involved in a local church like this church. And we got discipled and grew. And I felt God called me in the ministry. And here I am today, 1982 <laughs> till today because of the goodness of God, because Jesus was born. Amen. If you're here this morning and never trusted Christ, Brother John's going to come. We're going to sing a hymn. Think about that. If you died right now, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? If you can't answer that question, then I would suggest you speak to one of us after the service today, whenever it's convenient for you. We want to show you what the Word of God says about salvation. If you're a Christian, say, I have been born again. I've trusted Christ. Amen. Rejoice in these facts. I know it sounds negative. What if Christ had not been born? But think about that. Four points we went through today, and I could have listed a few others, but people need to hear the message, the Christmas, the true Christmas story message about the birth of a Savior. Amen? God with us, Emmanuel. Let's pray together, and then we'll sing a song, and I think about your life. Father, thank you for this time together in your word. Bless the singing of the invitation and the time of, of contemplation about our eternal destiny. Be with folks here that have not trusted you. Help them to turn to Christ and help Christians to rejoice in the fact that God is true. Bless this time now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.